Good morning, team, and welcome to our Geoscience Australia GIS Day webinar. My name is Lisa Bush, and I'm the branch head of the National Location Information Branch here at Geoscience Australia. And it is my absolute pleasure to be able to uh, welcome a number of speakers today to be able to talk about what they're doing in geographic information systems. But before I begin, I'd like to do a short acknowledgement of country. So Geoscience Australia values the land, water and sky as we work to deepen our shared understanding of country and earth. We respect our First Nations people and their enduring connection, contribution and obligations to country. Reflecting on our shared history, we are committed to listen and learn. Today, I and many of us are dialed in from Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, but I know that we have people dialed in from country all across this nation. So I'd like to extend our respects to the elders past, present and emerging from whatever country you are dialing into today, in from today, my apologies. Well, thank you for taking our time out of your very busy days. I know that this day and around this day is extraordinarily busy for GIS uh, professionals, which uh, I know many of you um, are. Today is the 25th uh, GIS uh, Global GIS Day, which is kind of extra extraordinary. And personally, it's both exciting and moderately terrifying knowing that I've been in the GIS business all of those 25 years. Um, it is also interesting on a, a bit of Googling to know that the first modern GIS was established in 1962, which is also kind of incredible. We do know that the, um, the basis for modern GIS actually extends um, well, you know, hundreds of years in the past, but the modern GIS um, started in 1962 and has continued to um, evolve and grow since that time. And many of us work intimately with geographic information systems in our everyday life. So, Within uh, this hour, I will shortly introduce you to four presenters who are going to talk about how they're using a GIS or a geographic information system to underpin their day-to-day -day business and in doing so enable better place-based decision making across this nation. So we have uh, four presenters today. The first will be Lilla Kennelly from our Community Safety Branch. Lilla has over a decade of experience leading programs to improve the resilience of Australian communities, both at the local and federal government level. She is supporting our engagement and collaboration process to develop new geospatial services for the disaster response and recovery sector. We have Zi Huang from our Oceans, Reefs, Coast and the Antarctic branch, and he develops and applies GIS tools, spatial modeling methods and remote sensing techniques to map the seabed and oceanographic features of us on Australia's margins. We have Catherine Waltenberg from our Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. Catherine is the Geoscience Project Leader for a capability known as Geo, Geo Insight, a new tool to make geological information accessible to anyone who needs it, especially those who aren't geology experts, which is definitely me. And Katrina Ellingworth from our National Location Information Branch. Katrina brings her interdisciplinary approach to the Digital Atlas of Australia, and she is primarily focused in the human dimensions of integrated geospatial infrastructure. This includes orchestrating partnerships, fostering capability growth, and developing user-centric map applications. So we've got a pretty strong lineup, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all four of them, and I hope you are too. So I'll pass over first to Lilla. Over to you, Lilla. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a real pleasure and honour to be here today, so I want to thank Thank everyone who's given me the opportunity to be here. Um, like Lisa said, my name is Lily Canelli. I work in our community safety branch at Geoscience Australia. And today I'm here to just give one example of how Ge uh, Geoscience Australia is uh, using GIS to provide disaster response and recovery insights. So I work in community safety branch and our purpose is to provide information and insights to help reduce the impacts of disasters. And I wanted to share a few examples of what that looks like in our work. So for hazard monitoring and alerting, we uh, monitor 24-7 and alert for earthquake events via our uh, National Earthquake Alert Centre located in Canberra. Um, and we, under, we also undertake hazard science, so we drawing on that data around earthquakes, we then provide assessments such as the National Seismic Hazard Assessment, um, which helps to identify regions in Australia with a higher risk of that earthquake activity. We also do things like model the potential vulnerability, impact and risk of hazard events on the community. So for example, our engineers develop vulnerability functions that help us to identify the types of bridges that might be most likely to be impacted by, for example, an earthquake event, um, which in turn then helps relevant state agencies to prioritise their inspection and response of those types of assets. 
So as you can see, there's maps in each of these um, and all of these community safety capabilities um, are all, uh, GIS really lies at the heart of all of these, um, telling us the what, the when and the where. And really underpinning all of this is spatial data that helps us transform information into things like reports, maps and apps that provide information out to our key users. We work with a really diverse range of stakeholders um, and today I wanted to share an example of how Geoscience Australia has worked with the National Emergency Management Agency and key Commonwealth and state and territory agencies to provide flood extent insights. Um, in a country as big as Australia and with the kind of increasing scale and size of our disaster events, um, what we've seen in the past is it's been a little bit challenging to get that kind of full national picture of those flood events. Historically, it's been challenging to get that information where we have um, geographical um, sparseness, we have uh, different states and territories with their own capabilities and drawing a real near real time picture of those flood events has, has at times been difficult especially when those events start to get larger in size and start to cross jurisdictional boundaries. So in response some time ago, Geoscience Australia approached the market to assist with this kind of challenge and uh, contracted a supplier called ISI, a company, to provide a service called Flood Insights to help uh, the Commonwealth and state agencies to support their disaster response and recovery efforts. So really briefly what ISI is, um, ISI provides near real-time data on both the flood extent but also the depth um, of, of floods using a constellation of INSA satellites that they've uh, deployed. So these satellites, a point of difference is that they um, see through darkness and clouds, which is great when it cloud, through clouds, great when there's a flood event. Um, and essentially that that service is um, automatically activated once there's a certain threshold met to provide quite granular data about where was flooded and also the depth of where was flooded as well, which is really important when we're looking at the potential impact of a flood on a community. So for anyone who's worked with um, satellite image and imagery based data, you'll know that it is large and relatively complex. So that raw data that comes through, it does require a level of GIS technical expertise in order to interact with it and make that into meaningful products for decision making. Um, so just on a technical level, that ISI data that comes through the flood, the flood insights data, um, comes through as vector for the extents and TIFFs for the extents, as well as raster data for those, sorry, for the depth information. What my team does here at Geoscience Australia in the community safety branch is take that data and transform that into what we would call data as a service that is optimised for web GIS, um, which means that users such as myself <laughs> can interact with that flood information more easily um, and in an environment that doesn't really need that really highly specialised GIS expertise. So essentially what my team does is, much smarter people than me, splits up this data into polygons that actually show that flood extent so that it can load much quicker and then have all of the relevant and contextual information ready to go. So I wanted to just give you an example. I'm not a hugely technical GIS person, um, but I was able to, in a very few number of clicks, develop uh, this map, which shows you some of the uh, recent uh, flood events over the last few years that have hit Queensland. And if I just want to zoom in here, I can start to see a little bit more about these flood extents and see where they hit. So around Ipswich, for example. And if I want to understand in a little bit more detail, what was this particular event about? I then have all this um, corresponding metadata about that flood event. So I can see its name. I can see its total size, the start and end date. I can see the release notes and the confidence levels in that data and its length and area, for example. So that information is all just available to me with a few clicks of a button rather than me needing to do kind of more advanced processing. And if I was a user that needed that flood information at that depth level and needed that more complex information, that's also available. But I think really optimising for WebGIS um, means that this information is, is automated for a greater number of users that might not have that kind of more detailed user experience of GIS. 
So I guess what's really exciting about this work and um, what I really what gets me up every day and makes me really excited to be here is what it what what automating that data can do further. So what further insights can we generate now that we have we have a better understanding of where those floods hit and how deep they are. So for example, now that web service is available and automated, we can start integrating other data sets. So for example, foundation spatial data from the Digital Atlas of Australia, and we can start overlaying that to help us give a better insight into the, the potential or likely impacts of a flood across a range of domains. So for example, across the social domain, we learnt key information about the populations that might be exposed to that event. In the built domain, we might get to understand how many roads and the lengths of roads that might be impacted by that flood or the number of buildings impacted. And in the economic domain, for example, the number of businesses that that flood might have, um, might have uh, uh, connected with. So again, I guess this what, what this means is that our users can quite easily create apps and maps using this data. And that can respond to whatever their business need is. So, for example, if I made it up and I was a state health department that was tracking post flood mosquito borne illnesses, this data is ready to go and ingest into my own environment where I could add my own data sets to help tell the story of what those um, potential health impacts could be from a flood event. And essentially providing this rich information to government really does help to increase an understanding of a hazard event like a flood and help to, to help to provide that information that um, assists with those decisions that need to be made about how to respond, how to recover from an event like this. So that was my really brief um, overview of what we do in community safety and just an example of how we're providing um, insights through GIS for disaster recovery and resilience always happy to talk about this um, and would love to talk more. So if you're on LinkedIn, please find me. My name should be hopefully on the screen here. There's not too many Lila Canellis in this world, I hope. Um, so please do go ahead and find me. Love to connect and really happy to reach out anytime. So I will now hand over to my lovely colleague, Ji Wang, who's going to talk to you about um, semi-automated GIS for seabed morphology and geomorphology mapping. Yeah, thank you, Lila. And uh, in the next 10 minutes, I just want to highlight uh, the reason and GIS mapping what we have been doing in the marine teams. In the last uh, several years, we have established this uh, seabed geomorphology mapping workflow in the marine teams. So this workflow starts with the pathemic grid. We first map the the shape of the seabed features, which we call morphology. This is according to the Dolph and others 2020 um, classification scheme. With additional seabed data, for example, the best scatter data, the sediment samples, or seabed start surface, start surface image from subbottom profile or from the seismic data, we are able to map the seabed geomorphology by interpreting the settings and projects of these uh, seabed features. This is done through the, uh, according to the Nansen and others 2023 classification scheme. And with this uh, seabed geomorphology and morphology product, they are they, they are providing key information and knowledge for a range of marine applications showing here. For example, we can use them for uh, better management of marine park or for the design and establishment or offshore renewable energy project, for example. To streamline this uh, workflow, we have developed a number of ArcGIS Python tools, including in here the Geoscience Australian uh, semi automate uh, morphology mapping tool, which we call GSAM2. Tool. These, tool, these tools are used to map the seabed morph uh, morphology. We also have developed GIS tool for mapping the uh, uh, seabed geomorphology, and also have uh, QAQC tool for the assessment of the uh, classification accuracies. I just uh, to interact here. So the, the workflow uh, I just described have these three key components here. We have these two classification schemes, and also these uh, arches plot Python tools we have developed. So this formed the, the, the ocean best practice of seabed 
geomorphology mapping. And these are just Python to are uh, used to operationalize this ocean-based practice. Next, I just want to quickly introduce this JSON tool. The JSON tool is based on these three step solutions. We use bathymetry data as our input. The first step is the map step. So the map step actually uh, delineates the polygon boundaries or seabed features. The second step is a uh, categorized step, which we calculate a large number of attributes uh, for each of these uh, feature polygons. So the last step is the classified step, which is based on a subset of these attributes and a loop set. We are able to classify this, uh, each of these uh, feature polygons into one of the morphology categories. And these are the tools, are the ArcGIS prod Python tools when they actually import into the ArcGIS prod. And this is showing you the GA sound tool, which including tools for the three key steps, and also additional tool for helping the mapping process. Of course, we also have tools for mapping the geomorphology, and we have QAQC tool for conducting the QAQC process. Once these two are import into ArcGIS Pro, they behave exactly the same as any other standard GIS tool. So clicking any of these two will open an interface for accepting input and, and executing the tools. This map showing you the areas we have mapped the seabed morphology and geomorphology so far. So you can see this location are spread across the entire uh, Australian margin and some of these are along the Antarctic margin as well. Next, I want to just give two quick examples. Um, first example is for a location in the uh, Coral Sea Marine Park. The other example is for a location in the Oceanic Shell Marine Park. Flinder Reef is a coral reef in the Coral Sea Marine Parks. So we have used JSON to map the bathymetry high features on this reef. So the JSON tool can be used to map multiple scale of seabed features. For example, at this broad scale, we have mapped this reef into three sea mounts and one nonce. But we have also mapped medium to five scale features for this reef. There are, there are many of these uh, uh, scale of features. In, in this particular example, we have mapped them into six categories of seabed bathymetry high features. Just for zooming into these small areas, you can see the details of these uh, five scale features have been met relatively accurately. And the next example is, uh, is for location in the Oceanic Shell Marine Park. In this case, we use JSON to map the bathymetry low features. Uh, in, in, in this particular case, we map uh, over 100,000 tiny depression features with about 10 meters wide or about one meter deep. This is just showing you what these features looks like on the seabed. We actually interpret these features as uh, seabed port marks. One thing to emphasize here, with these many numbers of features, you are just in virtually impossible to map them uh, man manually. In the next uh, several years, we are going to conduct national mapping of seabed morphology and geomorphology under the RED program. Use a range of bathymetry grid, including this one, which is a uh, national 250-meter bathymetry grid plus a number of regional grid and a large number of bot bin derived bathymetry grid. We intend to deliver a number of national product, for example, including the CMAP, uh, CMAP geomorphic, geomorphic uh, data sets, a national CMAP data set, national submarine canyon data set, and national reef data sets. I know that um, a number of colleagues in GA are developing and using these ArcGIS Pro Python tools. I just want to uh, quickly summarize 
the key advantage of this artist for Python tools according to my experience. First is artist pro Python tools are powerful in extending GIS capability because they not only have access to existing ArcGIS Pro tool and functions through the ArcPy Python modules, but also able to utilize numerous open source Python modules. Also, these ArcGIS Pro Python tools are seamlessly embedded in ArcGIS Pro with additional advantages. So they can be called and run in Python mode window or Python script for batch processing, just like any other standard ArcGIS tool. But they can have extended metadata. And most importantly, they can be modified and improved by individual users through editing the Python codes behind the tools. Just want to give a quick example here. Uh, we, in JSON2, we have used this multi-processing uh, Python modules to significantly improve our tool performance. So this diagram showing you the comparison between just using one process or using six processes. In this occasion, for, for example, uh, the multi-process uh, has resulted in a reduction of 10 times reduction of the processing time or R2. Yeah, this is this is last slide. Just uh, some additional information for the tools and the, and the, and the web service we have published for some of our uh, CMET, CMET morphology and morphology products. Uh, I I will now hand over to Kathleen Waterburn, who will present on using geospatial information to understand Australia's buried natural resource. Thank you. Thank you so much and happy GIS day everybody. Uh, just as my presentation comes up, I think we're on slide one, hopefully some can be hands, a thumbs up if it looks good. Thank you. Um, so whenever I give a presentation, I'm always speaking on behalf of a team. And in this case, I'm speaking on behalf of the entire Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division to give you a uh, quick glimpse into some of the ways that we're using geospatial information to understand Australia's buried natural resources. So in our division in Geoscience Australia, we uh, work to understand our natural resources to support um, things like identifying potential new sources of critical minerals, including those needed for the transition to net zero, like uh, metals that we need for solar panels, for example, as well as investigating the source, storage and sequestration of a range of energy resources and their byproducts. And we must also provide understanding of groundwater to support the sustainable management of water resources that we need for environment communities and also the industries that I mentioned beforehand. Uh, water management is particularly important in Australia um, as it's just not quite as easy as for us as some other countries to access these water resources and to manage them um, productively. So um, the way we do this at Geoscience Australia is to collect a range of data across the country, uh, including scientific techniques that give us a picture of what's below the surface of the earth. So here we're looking at an image of our airborne electromagnetics data, which comes under the flagship name of AEM. Uh, and what you're seeing here is um, uh, an illustration of, of how this data measures differences in electrical conductivity up to hundreds of metres below the surface. And each line you can see on this map is the flight path of an aircraft with a sensor that took those measurements. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how we use this data and data like this to understand our buried natural resources. Now, um, just before I forget, I popped a QR code on most of these slides. If any of these catch a particular fancy, you're welcome to um, use those to, to head to directly to these data sources, which are, again, from across um, the whole division and beyond as well, actually. So in this image, we're looking at a zoomed in picture of the airborne electromagnetics. And we can use this data for a range of purposes. And we always aim to collect and deliver the data in ways that anyone who might be able to make use of it can, can access and find it useful. So as I said, 
this data maps the electrical conductivity of the subsurface. And we can use this to do things like finding and understanding mineral deposits. For example, perhaps metal rich rocks might be a different conductivity to the surrounding geology maybe. Uh, we can use it to investigate sites to store, store hydrogen underground um, with the aim to um, provide information that might make it more economically viable as an energy source uh, and to understand groundwater among many other uses. So in this picture, what I'm showing is a groundwater example. Freshwater and saltwater have different conductivities. And here in this picture, the blues, which you can see um, labelled on the, on the map, um, may represent freshwater in aquifers. But near the coast, the reds might indicate places where salt water is coming in and intruding into those aquifers. So that's one simple example of ways that this data can help understand and manage water resources. I'm going to show you another example now, still on the groundwater theme. This is a satellite image of the area near Wilcannia in outback New South Wales. Um, and this is from, I got this from the Digital Earth Australia's water observation set. So if we overlay the water observations information, uh, the way what we're looking at here is um, there's a legend on the left hand side and um, this is satellite imagery um, collected over many years and any time water um, is observed on a surface in a pixel, it's um, it's measured and mapped and counted. So the, the, the reds and zero colour mean little to no water and the blues mean there's always water. And I can't see a lot of blues on this map anywhere, even in the lakes and waterways. So this is an area of Australia that um, doesn't always, in fact, about maybe only 20% of the time has, has water on the surface, which just goes to really highlight, I think, you know, how important it is to understand the water resources that we do have in Australia. So um, it's not just surface water that can be used for, for people, the environment and industry. It's also groundwater, which is below the surface. So using the same kind of data that I was talking about earlier, um, uh, conductivity mapping of the um, area below ground. This is the same area. You can see the lakes on that little map there. Um, and But maybe you're finding it a bit tricky to map to where the rivers and, and so on were. Um, so this is 30 five to 38 meters below approximately. And again, using the same idea that fresh and salt water have different conductivities. What the team um, found in this area is that it looks like there may be areas below the ground where there are fresh water, there's fresh water that could be available for communities uh, in this area to use. So more um, investigation has to be done on how to sustainably um, manage um, this, this water resource, but it, it goes to show the power of, of using both um, surface observations and um, below ground observations to really understand a whole system. Um, Changing focus now to another um, example from a different area of our work. So now I'm going to be talking about um, work that we do to understand um, where different mineral deposits might be um, with the aim of, of particularly looking for um, places that we can access critical minerals, the kinds of minerals that, that go into solar panels and, and um, wind turbines and um, batteries and that kind of thing. So this is one of a series of maps that we have produced and will keep producing. This one shows rare earth element mineral potential. What it's showing based on the colours, red is high and, and blues are low, is the geological likelihood of a certain type of mineral deposit being present based on a combination of a whole range of geological um, input data sets. So it could be the geology, you know, granites or, or volcanic rocks or sediments. Uh, it could be faults and, and so on. It could be the, the heat um, in certain parts of, of the, the rock, that kind of thing. Um, combining them all, um, applying statistical um, uh, functions to them and some machine learning and, and producing these maps. Um, there's a lot of scientific expertise that goes into these. Um, and the ways that these get used, they do get used by mineral explorers to define where they might want to look at. Um, and, and that we do have 
um, evidence that, that these are used and, and have been used to discover new deposits. But they're also really useful for uh, planning purposes. So, for example, land use decisions. Um, an example that I like to use is, you know, if we're planning a large um, renewable energy hub, um, generally, it would be nice to know if, if with the location we're planning it is actually over the top of a site where we might need to extract minerals to build the solar panels, for example. Uh, and kind of decisions like that are, are being made more and more all across Australia. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, the point of this is is to to provide the the information so that these decisions can be made with the, the full range of of evidence. Uh, but we haven't stopped there. Um, the geology is one part of it. You know, will is is an area likely or not likely to have the minerals we need. But if you're in this business, you under you know that there's more than just if the rocks are right that makes something economic. Um, it's it's proximity to um, infrastructure like roads and electricity grids, um, the royalty set up, um, how deep these deposits are, that kind of thing. And so um, the Economic Fairways Mapper, which was um, developed as a collaboration between Monash University and Geoscience Australia, um, aims to apply that economic lens over the top of the geology to give a... Um, a, a, a view of things that's a bit more holistic and brings in um, some of the, I guess, economic realities into the picture. And if that wasn't enough, you know, you, you can you can get these maps and you can look at them, but it's also important to be able to test hypotheses and that kind of thing. So um, this one that I'm showing now is uh, the hydrogen version of the economic fairways, um, looking at production of, of hydrogen from various sources. Where it's, where it's more feasible potentially or not. Um, and this is an interactive version. So on the right-hand side, there's a whole um, set of, of um, drop-downs and, and levers you can pull to, to tweak the settings. Um, you know, there's a default there, but you can always, you know, investigate, you know, is production by solar energy, um, you know, more or less feasible than wind and, and you know, do you want to include information about desalinization, all, the, all these kinds of things so that you can, you know, test different hypotheses um, and that kind of thing and maybe you know where will a certain piece of infrastructure have the most impact that kind of thing um, so these are free everything I've talked about they're available online and um, they don't need any proprietary software so this this what you can see you can run in your web browser yeah so it's all, all I think very cool um, that what the teams have all done um, look I, I gave you a whirlwind um, tour right there on just a couple of things we're doing. Um, what you've seen in my talk um, was done under the Exploring for the Future program, which wrapped up this year very successfully. Um, and I've included a link there so you can browse through all the things that came out of that. But we are, um, as you mentioned, um, launching on the new exciting part, which is uh, Resourcing Australia's Prosperity beginning this year. Um, it, it builds on the success of Exploring for the Future, but it also includes um, exciting new friends like um, looking at, um, for example, offshore wind infrastructure and, and what we can say about um, that kind of thing in terms of mapping the seabed. So um, thank you so much for listening. Again, happy GIS Day. I'm now going to hand over to Katrina Illingworth, who will present on our leadership empowering place-based decision-making through GIS. Thank you, Catherine. It is really, really wonderful to be here celebrating GIS Day. For national location information, GIS is our bread and butter. Our aim is to enable geographic information across the country. To provide the foundational infrastructure and knowledge for place-based decision-making in one of the largest nations in the world. Today we'll be running through a few of our projects to demonstrate the sheer breadth of work we of work and tools we use towards that goal. Cool. To begin with, as a Commonwealth body, GA is well in place is well placed to centralize cross-jurisdictional information. Programs like Elvis use scripted processing to combine publicly available information from a range of government sources into decision-ready data. Elevation and depth is essential for infrastructure planning, hazard modeling, and environmental analysis. The geospatial tooling allows for users to quickly find the data they need and pull it into their own systems for analysis. 
Meanwhile, the Australian Exposure Information Platform is built on behind the scenes statistical modeling to summarize populations, infrastructure, and environment that is present in a particular area. So whether you're interested in your local LGA or a hazard extent, the new interactive dashboards allow you to select, view, and export this information for wide use. One of the one of the most enduring roles of, of government is topographic mapping. The cartography and mapping team have taken this function into the future. By utilizing ArcGIS Pro map series function, they've created an, an automated and repeatable process for generating these maps. The program takes a single national sized map that generates printable regional maps to exceptional cartographic standards. Able to be downloaded directly from your home, the map series exemplifies innovative automated solutions to meet the core responsibilities of government within the modern world. The Digital Atlas of Australia is also revolution revolutionising how we access and interact with spatial information. Launched earlier this year, the Digital Atlas enhances and integrates Australian, the Australian government's geospatial infrastructure, providing the tools, governance and information to power data-driven decision-making at national and local levels. The design for the Digital Atlas addresses the challenge of providing spatial capability uplift and support for a wide range of users. For example, different environments. The Digital Atlas for Government is a secure environment for authenticated government users to explore and analyze data and access a full suite of professional quality GIS tools. Digital Atlas for Government acts as a secure collaboration space, allowing users to create and share apps and maps across agencies. The public Digital Atlas allows anyone, government, business, academia, communities, to access location data from a range of trusted sources in a central location. It also provides pre-configured applications to investigate data and tools for creating your own maps and visualizations. We utilize integrated geospatial infrastructure to connect system to system across government and beyond. Data is shared automatically and directly through a network of systems, providing a common operating picture for decision making. One of NLI's groundbreaking products being made available is Australia's first publicly accessible national bushfires dataset. Founded to address the challenges of black summer bushfires, it works in collaboration with 26 partner agencies to include both near real-time feeds from states and territories and historical data going back to the 19th century. All of this is automated and reproducible through FME coding, which powers the processing of this data into a nationally consistent picture. Another is the historical aerial photography application that allows you to search, view, and download over 800,000 aerial images by, lo by location dating back to the 1920s. And there are even more images on, on the way. Knowing what was there or what kind of industrial activities were conducted in a place in the past is important to minimize risks to new projects and activities. We've also been in contact with a man in his 80s who's lived in Margaret River in the Margaret River area his whole life. After a buddy in the rural fire service put him onto the digital atlas, he ended up driving over 100 kilometers to get, his, to get his computer fixed just because he wanted to view these images. He was able to pull for photographs from 1974 and got to walk down memory lane to see how his hometown had changed throughout his lifetime. As I said at the beginning, the work of National Location Information is not just using GIS for our own projects, but to provide the foundations needed for others to do the same. Nothing exemplifies this more than our work with the Department of Social Services. Utilizing the tools of the Digital Atlas for Government and our in-house geospatial expertise, they've gone from using PDFs and Excel spreadsheets to interrogate their data to building bespoke geospatial mapping applications in under a year. These apps are being built to directly address the needs of policy officers to make informed decisions about programs that affect people every single day. They truly show that there is no limit to what can be achieved with GIS, even in a remarkably short amount of time. So thank you for your time. This is just a snapshot of the work that we do. Please feel free to explore all of our other programs or reach out to learn more. This is again, just a very, very broad overview 
of the huge amount of work that we do. I'll now hand back to Lisa Bush, who I think has some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of our presenters today. Uh, whilst we've only had an opportunity to just hear a tiny bit about our work, how exciting is it? It gets me all, this is why we do what we do, right? To be able to enable better place-based decision-making, whatever our, our stakeholder remit is. Now, I'll just draw your attention to, we have just opened up the Q&A uh, session. We weren't sure if we'd actually have time to be able to do this, but we have got a few minutes. So uh, if you would like a question, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, you can go to the Q&A tab uh, in this Teams meeting and we can have a go at answering it uh, for you. And I'll also draw your attention to that. I've just dropped a couple of links there as well. If you're not working in Geoscience Australia, where you can find um, some more information on Geoscience Australia or the Digital Atlas and I encourage the other presenters if there's some links there that they want to post and take that opportunity as well. So at the moment I don't have any questions <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> type away or you can raise uh, your electronic hand and we can try and do it that way although sometimes it gets a bit crazy with over 200 people uh, online. Uh, while we wait I will ask our presenters something uh, a question, I guess, for each of you. And I guess it is, what has been your greatest challenge and your greatest success in the last 12 months in relation to GIS? So in order of presentation, Lila, we get to go to you first. Greatest challenge, greatest success in the last uh, 12 months. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, I think the thing that immediately springs to mind is the way that we, um, I understand and gather user requirements. I think there is maybe sometimes an expectation that that's a very technical process where you could just have a perfect document that states every single thing that a GIS application or map could do for a user and you build it and that's it. But um, I guess the, it's been a challenge to get to a point of building relationships where we can really meaningfully understand true business needs and true business requirements. And that's a relational process um, from my perspective. It's not just a document. It's not just a one-way transaction. It's a series of relationships you build over time to really understand what's happening for a user and then really trying to work in a collaborative way to start coming up with solutions. Because I think the exciting thing about GIS is that there is a really million ways to do something. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess my biggest success as well as the challenge has been how do we uh, engage and gather requirements in a way that's useful for the user and that's useful for the people doing development and actually forges business level relationships and doesn't kind of um, keep us just to a, a, a static document that we think we've completed. So yeah, that's both a challenge and success I've really, really enjoyed. And I wanna thank all the colleagues I've had the pleasure of working with, particularly the last year who've helped us to start figuring out the, the ways we can do that well. Thanks, Lila. I'm going to go to you, Z. What's your greatest challenge and uh, success in the last 12 months? Uh, thank you, Lisa. I mean, I think that for the, the challenge, I think not only for the last 12 months, it's for the entire period of development this all this GIS Python 2 is uh, my limitation in Python programming. I'm not a professional programmer, so I constantly find that my skill and knowledge is not good enough for for the, the purpose we want to do, for the tools that we want to develop. But, you know, I'm so lucky, I mean, um, to have a, a very supporting team behind me. So they're not only providing me all the feedbacks, uh, testing the tools and also in the de in design of these tools. And also, you know, we have been able to tap into professional Python programming skills in in our in our marine team as well so that's both a challenge and a success for for me to be able to have all these team together to develop these tools and, and and looking into the future as well thank you thank you something that many of us are um are sometimes challenged with when we're right up in the technical technical edge of what we're, we're trying to get after uh catherine let's go to you yeah, so I, I think a challenge that I'm very happy to embrace and take on is um, the one of communicating our complex science to people who aren't aren't up to date with the complexity of it. It's, you know, there's a couple of challenges there, always reminding myself, you know, 
people haven't spent 10 years studying geochronology and perhaps they don't know all the ins and outs of it or even what it is. So, but people still need the information that we all produce to make the decisions, even if they're not, you know, geoscientists of, of some type. Um, and I think maybe, you know, um, another part of that is, you know, it's it's so easy, I think, as scientists, and I find this myself, to get caught up in the, oh, you know, I guess the simple answer, it's not the complete answer, so what can I say that makes sense but isn't too, you know, making it too simple and where's the balance there? So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, you know, anyone who's who's kind of in this sphere has felt similar at some time. But, yeah, it's, it's a fun challenge um, and it, it's good to, to, I think, test ourselves against that and, and aim for understanding when we're, we're communicating our science and our um, GIS information out there. Thank, thanks, Catherine. I think you hit on a really good point that as geospatial professionals, many of us have the challenge of taking something that is really complex into simple, the technical into something that is not only uh, simple to understand, but has a compelling narrative to people who aren't geospatial uh, experts. Why does this matter for them? Absolutely. And it's something that, that the vast majority of us uh, struggle with in some regards, but like we have to get better of it collectively. Um, it, it is part of our core business. Uh, Katrina, let's go to you, please. God, so many challenges and exciting things over the last year. I'd say a major challenge for us more generally is how do we make GIS accessible uh, for people who have never been in this space before, people who want to use maps or who do use maps, but at a really surface level and who haven't had the opportunity to really see how deep they could go with this. So, and that's... Unfortunately, there's no simple solution to that. It's everything from making geospatial data available and everything from an Excel spreadsheet to a file geodatabase. How do you provide tools in that isn't that doesn't use a lot of the tools we use in GIS we are familiar with because they have the same symbols that we've used in other GIS tools. If you're brand new to that space, that can be really overwhelming. How do we slowly walk people through that um, to upskill in a way that d allows them to continue with their core business and allows them to make use of their subject matter expertise using GIS without having to outsource that to another spe more specialized GIS team? Which I know it's really exciting for me. Um, I get to work across government a lot and the overwhelming feedback we get is that GIS analysts aren't being used for analysis. They're being used to make very basic visualizations that frankly, with a little bit of training, a subject matter expert could do on their own. Um, so being able to watch people upskill and grow in that, and then watching the GIS analysts getting to do that really hard, nitty gritty technical work that you've seen across GA has been a really, really beautiful challenge to be able to work with. Such excellent points from all of you. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, team. Look, in terms of, um, we're going to wrap up very soon. Uh, we had a couple of questions online and, and a comment. So there's a question about, can we make this recording uh, available? Yes, we absolutely can. We'll sort that out and send you guys a link so that you can uh, refer to it later on. And we've also got some commentary about our cool GIS Day badges, which maybe you can or can't see. Uh, so I will actually do a massive shout out to our, our new chief of the Place and Communities Division, Marie Wilson, uh, who has gone and get the, these badges for the presenters who are doing GIS Day activities externally. Uh, so thanks, Marie, for taking the initiative. I love them too. So thank you very much. All right, so just to wrap up today, uh, thank you to each and every one of you for, for taking time in your busy schedules to look at what some of the teams across Geoscience Australia is doing in relation to geographic information systems. I encourage you all to take a moment to look at how far as a community we have come in the last 60 years and what we can do to each drive it forward over the next couple of years as individuals and part of the teams in which we sit. Thank you so much team and happy GIS day. Cheers.